So, authenticity tools in action. Um, this is going to be a demo of how we're going to use some of these, um, you know, open source apps that can add authenticity to it, and a little bit of a demo of how we chain together different uh, Web3 tools to build the prototypes that we do at Starling Lab. So I'm just going to do a quick overview, um, sort of a repeat of some of my talk before earlier, but then we're going to go into a demo. And if you see, um, there are little cell phones in front of you on the table. And there's going to come a point where I'm going to ask you to use uh, one of the Guardian Project's app called Proof Mode to take a picture and then upload it into a Google Drive. And from there, um, we can show the tool that we're going to use to register this on chain and do things like add C2PA manifest. But first, I need to tell you what all of those things are. So, Capture Store Verify is the framework that Starling Lab fouls when designing our prototype workflows for preserving authenticity for digital media in journalism, law, and history. So what the lab does is chains together a bunch of tools from hardware to software to blockchain um, to solve certain problems in journalism, law, and history. We strive to prototype how digital media can be preserved from glass to glass. So the glass of uh, the lens of a camera to the glass of the computer screen. The closer we can get to those bo both of those endpoints, preserving the data from end to end is, is the goal. We want to create provenance data with each change of custody or edit to a piece of media. This is, of course, an iterative process of capture, store, and verify. The data can and should be stored redundantly and with each step and verified often. Authenticated attributes uh, is a powerful tool that we added to this process, um, and by we I mean the Starling Lab engineering team, to, uh, to enable this traceable, immutable record of provenance uh, closer to glass to glass. So why do we need authenticated attributes? Well, we do a lot of investigations in journalism and in human rights investigations, that sort of thing. Investigations require collecting more and more web pages, images, and other documents, but we, all, we need to relate all of these things to the original source. So if I'm a uh, war photographer and I take a picture, um, there's more than just that picture that goes into a, a piece of investigative journalism. There's going to be research on web, websites, um, other sources of information, be it textual or an account, and of course other photographs that you might want to grab to corroborate these things. Right now, um, investigations really aren't that shareable because there's some technical limitations. Why do, we need the, uh, why do we need Authenticated Attributes Project to make it shareable? Why aren't they shareable now? For sharing data with other people, we have a few problems. First, we might not have a common way of referencing images and files across organizations. How do you know that the image I'm talking about is the same one you're talking about? Second, getting information secondhand isn't as good. If someone tells you that the CNN website says something, you have to go look at the site yourself to be sure. Traditionally, you have to go to the source and can't trust any information you get secondhand. I bet you all know what we might use to solve that. Um, third, we are likely to get conflicting information when we share our data. If we don't have a way to handle that, we'll be forced to exclude or reject data prematurely when we enter things in our database. Lastly, we have to make sure our images and metadata aren't tampered with, and traditionally, that has meant limiting access to the outside world. So we really don't want external people to be able to write to our database of assets. I'll show you, today I'm going to show you a demo of authenticated attributes, which has features to address each of these issues. So right now I'm talking about the, the software that we're using, but we're going to chain together a few different things. Authenticated Attributes is a metadata store that, can that we can use to add provenance to digital media, though it can be used with any piece of data. It's built on top of Hyper-B. It could also be built on top of Ceramic or any other um, data store. We're building a new integrity pipeline, which we use to register media that stores assets and metadata on authenticated attributes. This pipeline allows us to process and authenticate media in different formats, including proof mode, which is the um, app that you're going to try out now, bundles. And we can also do things like add C2PA manifests and even register on chain. We can tie each piece of metadata to the CID of the asset, and we call these attributes. Authenticated attributes is a software project from the Starling Lab. 
It uses an authenticated append-only database alongside modern cryptography to enable individuals and groups to securely store and share media and metadata. Using this system means the integrity and authenticity of files and metadata stored in the tool remains secure, even the, in the face of deep fakes and information, which is an existential threat that we're all facing. It also enables data relationships, linking assets and attributes, the metadata, to one another, even across uh, different organizations. Some key features that address these problems are trusted timestamping. We use open timestamps on Bitcoin, but there are other services. Uh, cryptographic signatures of metadata. So anytime a new attribute is appended and tied to a CID, it's timestamped, it's cryptographically signed. It can be signed by, the, it, right now it's just signed by the database. Ideally, we can get other signers in there. So that creates an unchangeable record of the edit history. So this is sort of just a visualization. Pictures, for me, I'm a big picture person and that helps me understand it. So let's say we have a photograph of a war. We'll hash that and we'll sign it. Typically in a database, you'd store all the pieces of metadata or information together as one big bundle. Instead here, we have a CID and each of those blue, um, blue boxes is an attribute. So it's a, a key value pair of what is this thing? Is it a caption? Is it a timestamp? Is that sort, that sort of thing? You can have as many or as few attributes connected to a CID and simply append more later. We can also um, make relationships between different pieces of media and make attestations about how a different piece of media or a different piece of metadata sort of proves or attests to different pieces of information. So the database consists of separate attributes. An asset, a media or any type of file is, one, um, is identified with a CID, and any metadata in the form of a key value pair that is added is related to that CID. Each attribute is signed and timestamped, and if this attribute is edited, it's just appended, it isn't deleted. So that way people can go in and say, hey, this person said this happened at this time, this person said this happened at this time, and you can look at who signed that and say, who do I trust more? Or you can look at, hey, there's four people that said this and one person that said this, I believe this. Um, it is really important that we're to understand that we're just creating a, a store of this information and we're not there to say this is the truth, this isn't the truth. We're creating a tool for humans to be able to go in and make good judgments about that. But we're creating good data for them to do that with because um, they know it, it hasn't been tampered with even as, if it's even um, publicly available. So let's look at the architecture of how we handle this. We'll get an asset and metadata from a capture device and it goes into the Starling Lab preprocessor. We actually separate this apart. The authenticated attributes database is well, right now publicly accessible. Um, but you know we don't want all the we don't want all the we don't want a photograph that we don't want shared with the world of variables. So we separate the asset into a file store, but all the metadata about it, so the content identifier of the photograph, and all the um, attributes which are time stamped and signed, go into the authenticated attributes database. Um, so you can see that we get that CID, the attribute, an attribute could be location and the value, Belgium, Brussels. Brussels, Belgium. We add a signature and we add a timestamp to it. Then um, the Starling Integrity backend can take the, um, when they need to do something with it, which we'll see with the CLI tool demo in a little bit, we'll pull, pull the, we can pull the asset from the file store if needed and pull the data for, from authenticated attributes. We can do, do a registration on chain and then go back and add that to authenticated attributes as another attribute. Uh, we could pull the asset and the metadata and archive it, and then we'd log that as another attribute, timestamp and signed, to our authenticated attributes database. So this is an example of what um, one, uh, one piece of information is in there. So this is, you can see that it's a CID, and you can see all of the attributes that have been added to it. Some of them are created by the Starling Integrity Pipeline um, when it's processed. So all of the ones at the bottom, like file name, file size, last modified, um, the MD5 hash, type, project path, all that sort of thing. But there are other things that are added on to it. Um, you can see that this is a, C we added a C2PA manif manifest to it. And that um, it has a child, which means that there's another piece of media that it's related to. 
Okay, so what, is, what, what makes up an ass testation? You start out with this tuple. You have the content identifier of the media, and then you'll have a, an attribute, the key value Perry, location, Brussels, Belgium. You get the raw attestation. Um, the key value store is always bound to a CID of digital media or other content. This tuple is bundled, and this is given a new attestation CID with the public key of the signer and signed, creating what we call the signature plus attestation CID. Next, using a timestamping service, we take the timestamp plus attestation CID and create the final CID that includes the immutable timestamp, giving us a new CID that is the timestamp plus signature plus attestation. From here, the data can be exported, pinned, stored, whatever you'd like to do with it. Uh, some of the features, all metadata, so every one of those attributes individually signed and uh, timestamped, and you can uh, export those as verifiable credentials or in whatever format you would wish. Um, the identifier is a cryptographic hash or a SHA-256 IPFS CID v1. Data is stored as DAG CBOR. Um, you can also, that makes it really easy to store it directly in IPFS. Um, and you can make comments about an attribute by referencing that CID of the signed and uh, timestamped one. Digital signature, signature library is Noble Crypto, uh, encryption NACL, and timestamping service open timestamps, but um, any of these can be switched out. Okay, so this is the second version of our pipeline. The original version for processing media was hard to configure. At the beginning of each project, we'd sit down with somebody and say, hey, what kind of um, media are you giving us? What kind of metadata do you wanna do? We had to build up a whole schema. We had to know that ahead of time, and we couldn't make changes once all of it went in. Each project meant we had to configure and trigger a waterfall of tools um, that did all sorts of things. We might want to add a C2PA manifest. We might want to register it on blockchain A, B, and C. We might want to pin it on IPFS, or we might not want to do it. So there was a lot of work just setting up this in ingestion pipeline. It would, didn't make sense. Um, in addition, we had to, yeah, we had to come up and stick to a data schema from the beginning. If we wanted to add a C2PA manifest to a WAXI that's a web archive file, then add custom metadata and only re register on one blockchain that was completely different than other projects. We had to reset up um, all the configurations and rerun it. So that's why we designed a new pipeline that will, score, that will store authentic to authenticated attributes. You start with just the, just the basics, you ingest the media, and then you do the processes that you wanna do using the command line tool. I wanna add a C2PA manifest. I wanna, put, I wanna do X, Y, Z. Now we can process a variety of types of files and packages and append each attribute as needed instead of setting up the schema ahead of time. If we want to register on, on a blockchain, you just reference that CID and, and register it on there. All right, so here's a quick demo, and then I'm gonna turn it over to you all on those cell phones on there to add things to it, and hopefully everything will go really, really well. All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at our database, we're gonna search all the CIDs. Um, there's certain things that you can do, with, like search what's in there, because these are all CIDs, they're completely obfuscated, you don't know what this media is. Anybody can go in and search this. So let's take a look at one of them. So these are all the CIDs that are in sort of like just the public open part of our authenticated attributes database. All you really, all we can see about it right now is what the CIDs are. But, we can inspect one of the authenticated attributes. This one isn't very interesting. Uh, it came from the Dropbox folder, and all of these are individually at added attributes that just are automatically done when, when data comes into our pipeline. So I think this is just, what is this? It's a text file called test.txt that was uploaded or brought in, I think, through a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder. Um, but collections of assets in, are organized into projects. 
we can explore which projects exist. So what I'm gonna have you do later is drop something into a Dropbox folder, it's attached to a project. So you can look at what's in an individual project and see the assets in a project. So this is a separate project. These are all the CIDs that are in there. As you upload proof mode files into the Dropbox folder, we should see more. You can, we, can, we index by a few different things. We uh, index by the file name, what we call the asset origin ID, which is sort of like the path, and the project ID. So if I know, do I have it up here? No. Sorry about that. So if I know the file name of something, uh, this is some of the zip files are complicated, but Um, uh, it's hard, I can't see it's blocking it. All right, so now I have the C, I can search by a file now, and now I have the CID, and all I've got to do Now I can see all the attributes of it, and you can see that, yes, in fact, it matches that file name. Um, another thing you can search by that we've indexed by is the asset origin ID. It kind of shows a listing of paths. The path shows you the project and the type of content that you have. Um, so you can see that some things, I think, were uploaded directly, uh, or and what project they're in. So we have the demo project, the Dropbox demo project. IPFS camp demo project. So just another interesting way that we can search. So the public CLI tool has certain attributes. You can get, set, search, and export. You can only set if you have a JSON web token that is in your config file. So some of, some of the other commands that we're gonna try. You can search by individual attributes. Again, these are these individually signed and time-stamped items. These are sort of universal types that are created by the Starling Integrity Pipeline. You can see that this is a proof mode file. So some of the other things you can get, you can just get by like media type, or you can even get an attribute that's just a blockchain registration tied to the CID. Basic, basic functions. All right, it's so hands-on time. Everybody pick up one of these phones that is sit laying on the table. I need you guys to double fist your phones. Uh, you're gonna have the X, HTC Exodus uh, S1, and then you're gonna have your own phone, and I'm gonna ask you to scan a QR code. So here's the HTC phone unlock cap pattern. And then with your own phone, scan the instructions, and it's gonna walk you through a workflow. It has like little pictures. I want you to capture an image. So you're gonna use regular old camera. You're gonna generate a proof with proof mode. So proof mode is a tool that open source, open source tool from Guardian Project that allows you to sign it with a PGP key and hash it, and they also collect a lot of interesting metadata that we have our backend set up to, to process. Then, last but not least, you're gonna share it to a Google Drive folder 
to ingest assets into the Starling Integrity Pipeline. So you'll create an asset and you're going to pop it in and we're going to play around with it a little bit. So uh, exactly the, the, the app that uh, has brought all this fascination is Proof Mood. Uh, it does add metadata into the pictures that you've taken. So uh, it adds uh, info like uh, the phone make, the model, the GPS coordinates, network connection, the IMSI, uh, the date and time, and also becomes officially notarized to just verify that it does exist in the real world. Um, and then you're able to actually, you're able to actually send the info in whichever way you'd want to actually have it. So you can send it via signal or email or whichever app that you need to prove that the image you took does exist in the real world. Also, uh, there is now a, a proof audio in development whereby you're able to take like an audio recording of it and it has the same uh, level of metadata onto your uh, file, the audio files. And yeah, you can just open the, unlock the phone and then draw an S and then on the same device you'd find proof audio. So these, these are probably proof mode outside of, when we're capturing photos on a cell phone, this is what we use because it, it adds a PGP signature and it hashes it like as close we, as we can possibly get to the lens of the camera. So it's doing it right on there. Sometimes in workflows we don't sign it or we don't, you know, we don't hash it until it gets uploaded. So doing it this early really adds a better piece of provenance right there. Yeah, I was just curious if it grabs any identity characteristics from the device because uh, spoofing identity is, is a separate big problem, right? Where, uh, where you know, like, let's say that you're taking a picture of Joe Biden doing something but that image is actually created by AI. Uh, how do you, you know, s sort of the photographer being able to sign and say, yes, I took this photo, that can add a lot of credibility to that content, uh, but you have to be able to trace it back and the provenance of that back to that photographer. Um, so one thing that Proofmo does that is pretty interesting too, it, it, it adds all the device info. It'll add information from the GPS location, but that can be spoofed. So it usually triangulates off of three cell phone towers and adds that data in as well. Um, if you if you do the generate proof pop process, you save to downloads. There's another app on there called Proof Check. And if you upload a, a proof mode file into Proof Check, it'll show you all the metadata, which is actually the next thing I have. This is the, the question he's kind of addressing is like, what is being captured here? So if, what, if you do the proof generation and then you save it to the phone, there is an app on there called Proof Check. It's a web app right now, so it's a little clunky on a cell phone. But you can upload the file into there and you can see all the sort of information that is gathered by proof mode. Obviously all the information about the phone. Um, the location down there, I didn't capture it on here, but there is a lot of location information. It has your PGP key. This key is assigned by the app, which to me is not ideal, I'd rather upload my own, but it's, it's, assigned, by, it's assigned by the app and it's signed with it. There is, oh, it, does, it puts it on open timestamps, I forgot about that. It also puts it on open timestamps when it's uh, collected. And then it obviously uh, grabs all the EXIF metadata from the photo as well. So there's a, a rich set of metadata there coming from proof mode. What happens when I edit the photo with a photo editing app? Would it maintain any, would it lose some of this fidelity or would it add on additional metadata at that time? So that is what the C2PA standard is for. And these actually add a C, it adds a C2PA manifest on there. So if your software is compatible and knows how to add to that manifest, it's stored in the EXIF metadata. So Photoshop does it. You go into Photoshop, you turn on content credentials, and it'll actually create a log of all the edits that were made by in, in that app. So yeah, it creates a really rich provenance. We registered on blockchain so that, you know, some people might strip it out as it goes, but we have a, a, a snapshot of what the original was in the most, you know. Sorry, uh, and yeah. if I may ask a follow-on question with that then. Um, so you're saying that the, this metadata can be stripped out? If you I mean, any metadata can be stripped out. A lot of times, and you want this happening, if you upload a, a photo to Facebook or whatever, you don't want your location, it's in the EXIF metadata, you don't want your location and things like that. So they, they strip out EXIF metadata. 
Um, that's why we register it on blockchain. Because if it's on blockchain and you have that content identifier, you can go back and be like, oh, the first instance of this was 40 days ago, and they have all this information, and it's probably the original. Um, I had heard about this project called Photo DNA, right? Which is there, what happens is people alter photos, and you know, like uh, especially in cases of illicit content, which the which large cloud providers are trying to block, they're uh, you know they're able to capture photos which may be derivatives of an original photograph using this fingerprint that they create. So okay, okay. So, it sounds like uh, it sounds familiar. Yeah, okay. um, I mean it's all you know all good work towards the same thing, which is yeah creating that provenance, Very cool. provenance metadata. So there are certain things that I can only do when I'm inside the Starlink server, which make, makes sense. Um, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Okay, so I'm going to go into the Starlink server. So now when I'm searching it, I can see some new CIDs in here in our project. And... I'm gonna ch uh, one of these. Which of these looks kind of new? I'm trying to guess. All right. No, oh, that's not an interesting one. Maybe this one's a proof mode bundle. So proof mode bundles are, are processed differently than um, photos. What we actually do is we ingest all the metadata from proof mode and all of the sensitive, well, we take all the metadata from proof mode, but we also encrypt that because we don't want somebody to upload a photo and have their location super, super public. Uh, so this one is, yes, so this one is a proof mode bundle. It has that data. I can unencrypt it because I'm in the. I have the key, access to the key through the Startlink server, um, but yeah. So this is a, a little bit more of a rich one. So it takes the proof mode bundle. It um, it extracts the file, and it also extracts extracts the proof mode information. So this is a really. You can see how this tool is starting to be useful to us and why we built it, right? Because we're pulling in different types of data. We need to create different types of attributes for it. Uh, this one's even been registered on uh, which blockchain? Numbers. It's been registered on Numbers blockchain. Um, so we can explore a proof mode file. And I'm glad that I found one, because now I can take a look at it. So because I have this on I can decrypt it. It's an, I'm using a flag saying, OK, this is an encrypted file. Let's see what's in it. I'm going to take that encrypted proof mode metadata, which is not super well formatted, which we'll fix later. But you can see all of the proof mode metadata. There's so various signatures. And you can see all the information that is pu pulled from proof mode. Location, longitude, the accuracy, the bearing. Uh, what else do we have in there? English of my, the English is the version on my, on my app or my phone, I'm not sure. Screen size, so that this is pulling out and decrypting all of that proof mode information, which is really useful to us. Some of the other things we can do with the pipeline, add a C2PA manifest. Raise your hand if C2PA is just a random combination of letters to you and you don't know what it is. Okay, I'll explain that. So C2PA, Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, it is a, a set of standards created by the Content Authenticity Initiative. Uh, it's a group of people, uh, Adobe, uh, Microsoft, who else is in there? Lots of big tech companies, huh? Sony. Sony's in there, yep, Sony made a, it released a camera um, that, that com co con conforms to this. And it's essentially a way of adding a manifest a traceable you know, hash link manifest into the EXIF metadata. So if you capture it with a, there are cameras that exist that when you take a, click the shutter, it adds a C2PA manifest. I'm not sure, if, I think this version of proof mode doesn't do it, but newer versions of proof mode that are on a newer phone than that six-year-old one do. Um, so if you, 
if you were working with a camera and then you put it into Photoshop and then you work with LivePeer is another app that you can upload things to it. What these things should do is keep adding on to that, that chain of that manifest metadata and it's tied into the exit metadata and it can travel with it. Is it perfect? No, it gets stripped all the time. That's why we register it on the blockchain. So, let's see, does this one have a manifest? Does this one have one? No, I don't think this one has one. So what I'm gonna do now is, we have this nice proof mode bundle, but it doesn't have a C2PA manifest on here. What do you think is gonna happen to the CID when I add a manifest onto it that's in the EXIF metadata? It's gonna change. <laughs> so. Did it happen? Did I do it right? No, I didn't do it right. Sorry. Um. This is not the most. So I'm going to add a manifest. Ooh, no. That's why it's not working, okay. I'm, fi I'm trying to figure out where and I hit control why it doesn't just jump back through the whole thing, but I think it's because I have a screen. Okay, so it's added a, oh. Plabby, okay, yeah. Okay, so there we go. Now when we inspect it, you see that we have this child. So we've created a new CID. It's pointed back to this CID. So now all we need to do is take a look at this one. And you can see this is the version that we have Again, again, spaces, yeah. So you, we have a new, we have a new item, and we we have uh, and then attribute that ties it back to the parent CID. Cool thing. This will take a minute, but um, we can register an asset on uh, a few different blockchains. We're using the numbers API to do this. So I'm gonna get a, try to pick out a file that does not have a registration as an attribute. Let's take a look at them. Okay. I wish you, I wish you could get, see the CID. Let's see about this one. Okay, this one's not registered. This is a, this does have a C2PA manifest. What is this one? I don't know what this file is, but okay. Um, we're gonna register on, on the blockchain nonetheless. I'm just gonna jump ahead. We can do testnet, um, but I'm actually just gonna jump ahead and do this one on the numbers blockchain. So I think we do numbers near an avalanche are the three registrations that you can do with the numbers API. It'll take a minute. a really long minute. 
But yeah, you can do like a dry run registration just to see what kind of um, uh, metadata would be created. You can register on the test net and you can register on, on a few different chains. And if you look at it again, you can now see that we have a registration and you can go to a numbers block explorer, which I'm not gonna do, um, but you can see uh, this blockchain registration. So again, I didn't have to put up, I didn't have to put a schema, I ingested a file and then I'm like, yep, today I want C2K manifest, today I want a, uh, a blockchain registration and there we go, it's, it's ready to go. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to show you, but I'm not gonna do it, is that you can export verifiable credentials. Who's, who's familiar with the, what those are? Um, it's just a standard for like having something tied to an identity and it's signed and it's hashed and oh, I'm not explaining this very well. Verifiable credentials are really useful though because then we can take um, individual attributes and, and put them in all sorts of different places. So um, yeah, I wanna give credit where credit is due. A lot of the research for creating this was done by Kate Sills. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she has a consulting agency called Plaintech Solutions. Uh, you can contact her at llccaitlinsills.com. And then our amaz amazing engineers that are part of Haifa Co-op. Uh, Cole Anthony Capilongo was the one who did a lot of the implementation with this. And then of course, under with a lot of help from Benedict Lauer, CTO, who's very good at spending hours and hours explaining these things to me. So, so yeah. All right, thank you so much.